now arrived at stage four, which is the technical design stage. Um, here we're going to see how the model becomes more data rich. We'll see more input from the various disciplines. And don't forget, we've now got Steve on board. So we'll see how uh, the contractor, in particular the specialist subcontractors, also um, influence and impact on the design stage. So without further ado, I shall pass over to Michael. We're, we're back on Jack again, and we want to talk about how we're going to move this model that's being developed to a degree um, to the next stage. So for those of you who've heard me talk before, the building before was probably modeled in cheese, and we now need to move that forwards into some real world components. But bearing in mind that if we're not actually in charge of the procurement of those components, don't go overboard, because I've heard there's a contractor lurking around out there somewhere, um, and we know what he's going to get up to. So really, you know, it, it's about looking at the information that we know we're in control of, and from a design perspective, I know that the EIR was asking me uh, things around the doors, for example, that look like the fire ratings, the type of acoustic nature of, the, of that information, the materials that we were going to be using around that door, uh, uh, and true size for procurement. So what information can I give Steve that's going to help him um, control and do, do the best job against cost? I also want to start to, uh, to understand what information I might be able to align with Paul's FX360 system. As we heard earlier from, from Steve, this isn't a Kobe deliverable. It doesn't need to be because we know the, the end placement, the home of this data later on. So I'm going to start to look at that as well. Now, the good news is we have an earlier contractor engagement. We know what the team looks like. And I'm actually starting to get some really uh, solid construction advice out of Steve and as much as important as Steve is actually he's brought on board some of his primary subcontractors as well um, now if we think about the duplication again I think Steve's touched on it earlier if we overdevelop the design in the professional um, consultancy environment pass that over to a contractor um, there is an element of duplication of rework of drawn again modeled again um, and my client doesn't really want that. So part of my remit as, as lead consultant was to try and ensure and advise that he's not buying things twice. Um, and I'm quite happy that this one-touch process is going to enable me to do that. So moving onwards, um, let's add some more detail to that initial Revit model that we developed at the RIBA stage three. Um, remember we had the space information in the model so we have airflow and MEP type of information that's available to us now. Um, and that space information, that placeholder that we put in there, is now going to enable us to start to put a system together. So what I want to do is put some grills in the ceiling below that void. So I'm going to choose the appropriate grill. I know the offsets. I'm going to get the height right. I'm going to drop those geometries into the system, like so. And I'm dropping this in with you know, great clarity and confidence that it's going in at the right height. I'm working in a three-dimensional plane, albeit uh, two-dimensional as I'm seeing. Now I'm selecting those and making them part of, um, part of a service. Again, that service is going to be dictated to me by what's written in the EIR. So it's a supply air system in this case. And we're going to link those together. And add those elements to that system. So I've created it once. What elements are related to that same system? That's done that quite nicely for me. And there we are. So the next thing I want to think about is I've got the grills. I've got them in the right place. They need to be part of a system. Let's look at um, placing a base point. The base point comes up in that vertical riser there. Um, I can now associate um, and look at solutions. The system's going to go off automatically. Um, and offer me a number of options. So I can choose the one that I think might be most appropriate. I might decide to start from scratch and design it totally myself. But it's giving me some, some really good indicators there. And as we can see, that's the solution I've chosen. It's, it's run off and it's organized that into a system. And if we actually look at the data behind that geometry, you'll see now there are actually some, some real and appropriate flow rates that, that are sitting there for me to, uh, to have confidence in. Remembering we're in that three-dimensional collaborative world, 
that's my architectural view. I need to switch that architectural content off. Uh, and then hopefully after the, uh, the information about model has been switched off in visual graphics, we can see there is my chosen design system. Hopefully you can see how that's developed from where it was in the model that I created before lunch. I've got confidence it's in the right place. It's befitting what I want. Um, the data is there. It's beginning to show me information relating to MEP flow rates, etc. So I'm feeling I'm in a good space there. Okay, creating and importing parameters. Now, if you remember, the client has asked for, for specific information against the assets. Um, you can see here we've got a door. That door comes preloaded out of the box, so we know, for example, its material, its size, its shape, etc. But Paul specified particular information against his requirements in his EIR. So I want to do something here to enable me to share parameters and create a shared parameter, which will enable me to add this client-specific information to that geometry, in this case, a door. So first things first, we're actually going to start to, to create um, a parameter. It's uh, the Excitec employer's information requirements. And we're going to start the process of identifying where these parameters go. Now, you can see at the moment that parameter box is empty. There's no extra additional data that's being applied to those geometries. We're going to create a new parameter group um, for door information and then associate that to the, the geometries here. So we're going to add that into there um, and create the information against the, the door type. In this particular case, the information we're going to add to it is fire-related data. And this was something that wasn't there in the original pick list. Um, so I'm going to add that. I'm also going to add, because Paul asked for it, um, acoustic information as well. And you can see that list is slowly generating there to be specific to what Paul's requirements are. I think it's important to note here that actually because we're creating specific information, we're not overloading ourselves commercially with filling data boxes in just because we can, okay? We're being very specific about, we're relating back to that EIR, and we're only going around creating information as per these four examples that's required um, at the end of the contract. So, there we can see we've created the extra parameters. If you look there at the materials and you look there at the, the data on the left-hand side, that has embellished itself from where it was before. That project parameter is now applied and it's shared against the, the data, the, the geometry sets. It's shared against, in this case, the doors. So we've identified that. There we go. And then one by one, we can associate those extra parameters into the database. So looking at um, filters in shared parameters, so we've seen how we've added an additional parameter. We've added specific information there to what Paul was requiring. What I want to think about here is it's not just about the client. What about me as a designer? What about being able to validate and verify information as I'm putting the information against these geometries? I can see the geometry, but I can't see the data. So what we want to have a look at here is the ease at which we can apply logic and color in this particular example, visual indicators to geometry. So we're looking as an example um, at fire doors and the process here is about identifying the type of door um, and the, in this particular case, uh, as I say, the, the fire rating. So what I'm going to be able to do is to set up a data set sitting behind and a filter sitting behind the geometry of the door which will show me visually on the drawing the status of the information behind that. Okay? So in simple terms, this is, a, is going to be um, a fire rated door um, it's going to be a fire rated door of um, 60 minutes and every door of that particular type will be showing as a particular colour. Now, not only is this going to give me the ability going forwards to start to look at my um, fire escape routes and things like that and the fit for purpose of the data or the geometries, the door types I'm choosing, it's going to give me the ability to identify geometries and elements that don't have data sat behind them that should 
So I know that Steve mentioned earlier, push the model back if it's not right. That's something I'm having to consider all the time. Have I put the right information behind the right geometry at the right time? And you can see here, it's a relatively simple process to choose at what projection level, at what cut level, what colors are going to be used to show very clearly um, the geometries in the case here, uh, as mentioned, doors. So I'm starting to protect myself at one level against this model coming back at me because the data isn't filled in as it should be. I'm giving myself a little bit of an insurance policy, um, which I think is quite a positive thing. So there we see it's a relatively simple process. We have uh, blue as a color, um, dare I say football's the game, um, against these particular doors. Uh, we're going to do the same thing again in this particular case, choose uh, a red color, choose the line, and be able to associate that with the cut levels um, and the positioning within the models. And I think if this continues through, the, the ease at which we're going to be able to show uh, the different types of doors. So here we are looking at the doors in the building. They're all blue. Um, well, we know what blue means now. They all have a 30-minute fire rating against them. It's a quick visual check. And there's lots of doors on this, on this project, even at this level. So it's giving me, as a designer, um, a better tool and an easier route through to validation. Again, we can start to position both the schedule against the geometry. And I think by now we've worked out that schedules and geometry are linked. Um, the additional aspect here, I suppose, is being able to understand and recognize how easy it is to change the fire rating in the door schedule, how that filter is then going to work in conjunction with the actual geometry and the outputs I'm seeing on the drawing. Um, so here we see that door pop into the schedule on the left-hand side. We can change that from a 30 minute to an hour and as if by magic, we're now seeing that representation reflecting the data change, which to me is a definite big positive step. Um, it's saving me a huge amount of time in printing out hard copy um, Excel spreadsheets and chasing them myself round and round in circles. So, Great tool and confirms I've got the right information at the right time. I'm a happy man. So what about scheduling these shared parameters? Now we've set them up. Um, we know it's great. All we've been talking about all day is information, information. But actually, I want to be able to get some of this out. Um, and I want to overcome that traditional problem of trying to align my door schedules uh, to the, the, the geometry shown in the, in the drawings. So we can see that we've added the door reference there. Um, we can see we've added extra information, the finishes. We can start to bespoke create this door schedule. Um, the information that came fresh out of the box is there for us to play with and to work with. But we've also got the information that we added in through those extra shared parameter files. So you can see the, the acoustics, the door ref, the finish, relating back to what the client wants. We can push this information out into an Excel spreadsheet. So once we've created this template, which is doing behind me at the moment, we can start to think about who's responsible for adding the data to these geometries. As an architect, I might not have that responsibility. It's going to be part of that procurement process later on when Steve goes out to market. So the advantage of having this, uh, this spreadsheet link, if you like, is we can use technologies such as IDA BIM link, we can push this raw data out, we can have the appropriate subcontractor work on it, and then push it back to me, and we can import it back into the system again. Coming back to the validation point, you can see very clearly here where the information is missing, where I've got to focus my attention. So again, I think I'm saving money and time, and I'm taking some of that risk that this model is going to be pushed back, thrown back, redirected at me when the contractor comes on board. Now, one of the historic challenges I've always faced as a designer is trying to get to grips with the amount of information that I'm producing related to these ever more complex um, rooms and buildings. If anybody's worked in a university environment, a hospital environment, the creation of sea sheets um, it, it, it is something that's always been a challenge. Linking that geometry of every plan and every elevation of that room with every shown element into a spreadsheet of asset. Yeah. And keeping it up to date, it sort of works once, but then people do keep going around this element here, going around this drawing sheet and changing things on a regular basis. So what I want to do here is to really show you how that within Revit, we can link 
through, um, through tags the information drawn and the information sitting within uh, the spreadsheets so we can overcome some of these challenges. So here we can see we've produced all of our, um, our drawings. Here's the plan. What I'm going to look at is editing this little group to understand and ascertain that they are all individual elements. So we have got a table, a desk, a chair, uh, and I'm happy that, that, that that's right. We're now going to add to those um, the, 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 the links. So if we bear with me for a minute, there we go. We're going to add some tags into here. We're going to tag them by furniture, for example. We're going to start to add some of the, the plumbing tags, the MEP tags. I'm going to add in a few generic ones because I'm sure I'll find a few more elements latterly in this design process. But basically, I'm setting up behind the scenes a database of available tags that I can pull over to that right-hand side of the sheet. So there you can see we've actually tagged all of those elements. So all of those geometries now have information stored behind them, and you're not wanting to labor this point again and again. But if we put the information in at the right time, we're able to manipulate it and drive the benefits out um, in areas that otherwise would have been quite a challenge. So I'm just going to move all of those tags out of the way because I've still got my architect hat on here. I'd still like to see um, a competently put together drawing uh, without too much information overlaid one on top of the other. One of the benefits of whilst it's rumbling through that is and just think about this process of the point of procurement information. If any of this information changes as a result of how Steve, or more importantly what Steve, might procure later on, we haven't got this historic challenge of finding out what it is and where it is and then retabulating it. It's going to be happening seamlessly, so we can use this as, a, as an information management tool going forward as much as we can at the moment. And for me, I mean, that, that's bringing massive benefits to, to, to the way I work and the confidence that I'm going to deliver against that EIR later on. So here we can see information um, has come across on the right-hand side. It's very easy to, um, to, to change, to add, add things to. I've never worked on a, system, on, a, on a scheme yet that doesn't change. So here you can see, very simplistically, we will add another coat hook. We'll add it in the geometry on the left-hand side of the system here. And if I've done this correctly, we should see that appear in the right-hand side um, of the room data sheet. Yes, so there we have two coat hooks where we have one. So again, coming back to this bidirectional linking, I'm happy that my, my drawn work and my written work is, is aligned. Equally so, if I want to take that out of the system, uh, I think we're going to see quite nicely that it's returned to uh, one of those elements. So basically, you know, as, a, as an example, I hope that shows those of you that aren't using room data sheets and tagging that there is this link that controls this, this level of information. So I've responded to the client's EIR. I've delivered against my BIM execution plan, and I've got increased confidence that the client team has delivered this digital model. I've delivered a digital model which can be passed on to the contracting team. Um, I think there's been some clear benefits of working alongside the client, showing them, working with them using these uh, technologies, getting engagement, getting pushback appropriately, uh, and really get, getting people to understand in an environment that might not be their natural domain what they're going to get, what they're paying for, um, and giving them some confidence that when they actually go out to tender with this, um, there's going to be a hopefully a lesser level of disappointment than sometimes there, there has been in the past. So my role is really coming to an end. Um, I, I think we've, we, we've done a good job. I'm, I'm happy that we've produced this coordinated, collaborated set of data. Um, it's time to hand that information over to, um, to Steve, see what the contractor can do with it. And I've heard all sorts of rumors, but I'm quite confident that he's got a really good starting point here. Um, and I'm going to be tracking this. You know, I've still got a responsibility in here. I've still got some modelling ownership, um, and I'm looking forward to that challenge of working with Steve. So what we've done in this session, we developed that initial design into more detail. Again, we took it from a made of cheese into, uh, into some real-world components where it was applicable. Um, we've spent some time looking at the value of that embedded data, how fast, easy, economical, is it for me to drive out schedules of information? 
How easy is it for me to actually start to look at linking the drawn environment with the data environment through those room data sheets? Um, and I'm happy with my output. So I think we're going to see what, uh, what a contractor can do with a digital representation of our built environment.